and the powers that have the power to change that are being controlled by other bigger powers who might be the source of some of the injustice to begin with. So it seems to be a vicious circle. Some Muslims are in fact turning to the Quran and to Islamic history. They're looking at the life of the Prophet and they're calling what they need to justify their actions. And anyone can do this. Anyone can go to the Bible or to any other sacred scripture or non-sacred scripture. Anyone can go to any book and find what they need, pick things out of context, make it read the, one, the way they want to read, make it read, and then they can justify their actions on that basis. So what is needed for us now is to study the Quran and the life example of the Prophet ﷺ carefully to understand two things. To understand how these sources are being misused in order to justify violence, whether by those who commit violence or by those who want to taint the image of Islam by insisting that Islam is a violent religion. And on the other hand, to understand now how to combat these misunderstandings, how to correct these misappropriations uh, of the verses and about the examples in the life, ex life history of the Prophet So very quickly, let us uh, look at the way in which the Prophet conducted himself. I want to, in, in 10 minutes, just look at the broad uh, scope of, of the prophetic career of our Prophet Muhammad because only by understanding his prophetic career can we understand what the verses of the Quran are speaking about. Now the Prophet ﷺ was born in Makkah in the year 570. That was the year of the elephant. When he was about 40 years old, he began receiving revelations. That was the year 610. Now the revelations that came to him for the next 13 years or so were known, or uh, come to be known now as the Makkah revelations. Those are verses of the Quran that were revealed to him during the time that he remained in Mecca in his hometown. Then, the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina, where he set up what would be called now an Islamic state. He was the virtual uh, re ruler of the region. And verses that came down to him in that period for the next 10 years until he went back to meet his Lord are referred to as the Medinan verses, because they came in the phase when he was in Medina. So we have the Quran being comprised of two sets of verses. And these verses are sometimes intermingled. In a single surah of the Quran, you may have some Mantan verses, and you may have some Medina verses. But for the large part, they are also separate. We have some surahs which are particularly known to be Medina surahs. You have Surah uh, Al-Anfal, for example, Surah 8, and uh, Surah Al-Tawbah, Surah 9, or Surah Baha, as it is also called. Surah 8 and Surah 9, in fact, are, ver are, are chapters which some people think must insist that Muslims be at war and at, in, in a state of violence against other people. We will show that this is not the case. The, the Meccan uh, verses and chapters are usually short. And they have very little content in terms of legislation. They mostly concentrate on the basic teachings of Islam in terms of beliefs. They concentrate on belief in God, belief in risala or communication from God, and belief in responsibility or the judgment before God and the resurrection uh, after death. These are some of the main items of belief. Some people say that when the Prophet peace be upon him was in Mecca, he was preaching only such verses which concentrate on Muslim belief, so he was in a way similar to many of the prophets that we know from the Old Testament of the Bible. And they insist that when the Prophet peace be upon him moved to Medina, this is when he not only took up the sword to fight against the enemies, but he made this his modus operandi. This was what he was all about. He was no longer about being a prophet and preaching about the things of the life hereafter, but he was this worldly and uh, a worldly comfort. We will show that this in fact is not the case. Now when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, began his prophetic career in Mecca, his hometown, he and his followers were being persecuted. And in those days, it was in fact dangerous to be a Muslim. I think it's even so now, but, but not like then. 
In, in fact, one might be, be killed for being a Muslim at that time. Many Muslims were tortured. They were, in fact, tied up, chained, and uh, they were being forced to recant their religion. We know the story of Bilal When Bilal embraced Islam, he was a slave. He was a black man, and he was owned by a woman who did not like his Islam. So because he was from a foreign region, of a different color, uh, and now a different religion, it's almost like, you know, try being Muslim uh, and Arab and black at the same time and be in London. Okay, it's not, not, not very favorable. So Bilal, uh, unfortunately, uh, found himself in this uh, situation of helplessness. The woman who owned him would actually hire people to beat him up so that he would give up his religion. And they would uh, have him lie on the burning sands of Mecca. And they would put a heavy stone on his chest. And they would say to him, Bilal, you either renounce your faith uh, or you die in this condition. And Bilal who would become the favorite of Muslims everywhere, would in that condition say, Ahad, Ahad, one, one. In the face of these people who were worshipping 360 idols, he was content to keep repeating the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to keep insisting that Allah is one. They would drag him through the streets of Mecca, but according to the Sirah works, he would be crying out in their way, Ahad, Ahad, one, one. That was Bilal. But that illustrates the kind of torture that Muslims were going through. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari was from the Ghifar tribe, as his uh, title would now signify. Abu Dhar came to Mecca to find the Prophet Muhammad because he heard about him and he wanted to hear something of his message. When he heard the message he was convinced, he embraced Islam right away. said, Messenger of God, I cannot rest until I go and declare the faith in front of these people who are denying it. So, and he went, and he declared in, in public, Ashhadu la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And the people fell upon him, beating him, and they would have killed him, except that Abu Sufyan, who at the time was not a Muslim, but he was a man with uh, a reasonable amount of gray matter between his two ears. He stood up and he said, uh, listen, if you kill this guy, uh, his people, they are the Gifar people after all, they will wear your caravans on the way to Syria. They were known as highway robbers. So you better leave him alone. And so they let him be. But the next day, Abu Dhar came to face the same danger. He came back in public and he was declaring again the Shahada at the top of his voice. These were the early Muslims who were being persecuted and tortured because of their faith. What happened when the Muslims moved to Medina? No, they, the non-Muslims would not let them be because they wanted to kill this faith and the people who would follow this faith. If it is known that they are setting up shop elsewhere, that their faith will, will, will thrive elsewhere, they would not let that happen. And so they came to attack the Muslims in one army and in, in one battle after another. So they came at Bada. They came at Ohud. They came at the Battle of Khanda, the Battle of the Trench. What were the Muslims to do? On the occasion of Badr, the Muslims were puzzled. What were they to do? They were a few people. And they could not face the heavy odds of the enemies. But God wanted them to finally establish themselves in the land. Islam must be here to stay. And so they were instructed to confront the enemy and to come to their defense. The first verse that is said to have been revealed regarding this is the verse in the Quran that is now found at Surah 22, a Medina verse, in Medina chapter, in verses number 39 and 40. So two verses. It begins by saying, Permission is given to those who have been attacked because they were oppressed. Those who have been expelled from their homes without justification. For the only reason that they have said, Our Lord is God. So, the verse of course is very brief. And one has to know this background. This is why I tried to trace for you this background. 
The verse is speaking about people who have been oppressed, people who are being attacked, and people who have been driven out of their homes for no, without justification and for no other reason except that they have declared that their Lord is God. These were the Muslims who had been driven out from their hometown. Remember the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, left his hometown in Mecca. Now he has taken up safe residence in Medina. His policy was to leave the scene of violence where the Muslims were being persecuted and tortured. He and his followers migrated away. They wanted to just simply find peace in Medina. Their policy was to live and let live. But the policy of the others was to live and let die. And so they came marching against the Muslims. The Muslims were now to come to their own defense. And that's what this verse spoke about. But there were limitations on what could be done if Muslims were to enter the battle arena. And those are spelled out in some other verses which are also said to be revealed at about this time. They are now found in Surah 2. So you get the sense that verses are revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, on a variety of occasions. And now they are found in a, in a variety of references in the Quran. One has to know where to look for things. And one knows that by looking at the classical commentaries, such as the Tafsir of Al-Qawri or Imam Al-Qurtubi. One can see the connections that are being made and uh, the references given to actual occasions and circumstances in which various passages of the Quran were revealed. So Imam al-Qurtubi tells us that Surah 2 verses 194 were some of the verses revealed in reference to this occasion. Permission is now given to the Muslims to fight and they're being told what are the limitations of these. Verse number nine, 190 says, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يَقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَلُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَلِينَ Fight in the way of God against those who are attacking you. But do not transgress. For surely, God does not like those who transgress. So permission is given to them to fight. Imam al-Qurtubi says, that uh, the, the term that is used here for fighting in Arabic is qital. And qital in Arabic it, it, it is, is on the, 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 the verbal form that is known as fi'al, on that wazn. And that wazn or that form, that measure of an Arabic word, introduces the idea of reciprocity, muqatala. Two entities doing it with each other. It's not one person doing it to another, but two entities doing it to each other. In other words, just like our English word fight is different from the word attack. Attack means one person doing it to another. Two persons fighting means two persons are fighting with each other or against each other. In a similar way, Imam Al-Qurtubi says, and he wrote this a long time before 9-11, he was an apologist for the present time, trying to make Islam look good to others. He was just telling it like it is. He was saying that this word itself does not mean that Muslims go to attack others, but it means that Muslims can engage others in battle, can fight with others, because that is the verbal form of the word. But more than this, the verse itself says, وَقَاتِلُوا and fight. Forget about now the verbal form of the word. Progress further. فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ So fight in the way of God against, it specifies, those who are attacking you. Those who are fighting you. But of course, in putting it together, it has to be those who are attacking you. Because if nobody is attacking you, there's nobody to fight. That's the point. And then it even goes further to say, but, but do not transgress. So you have limitations. Because God does not like those who transgress. So we have limits. There are preconditions, and then there are limits to how we might engage in a battle with others. So now you see the entire situation before you. Now the Muslims go to war and, and they defend themselves. They are few, but God gives them victory. The non-Muslims are not happy with this state of affairs. They lose at battle, but they decide to come back a year later at Uppal. They come back stronger, and this time the Muslims appear to be winning, but then eventually things come to a draw. It might be interpreted differently. Some people may say that the Muslims lost on this occasion. 
And the Quran assures the Muslims that these are, are, are situations that God brings about between people. Sometimes they win, sometimes you win. But these are the days that we alternate between people, God is saying, in the Quran. So sometimes they'll have it better, sometimes you'll have it better. You just have to be patient and let the plan of God unfold. But still, the non-Muslims are not happy with this because even though they were pressing home a victory which they could not finally press home to its, uh, to its limits, they had to retreat. With whatever gains, they retreat. But they want to come back for more. They want to kill off the Muslims. So in the fifth year of the Hijra, after the Prophet Muhammad and his followers had migrated away from his hometown, the non-Muslims gathered together an allied force from all over the region, from different religions. They came to attack the Muslims at Medina. And that force was so strong that it would not make sense to go out and meet them, as the Muslims did at Babur and at Bokot. And I say go out to meet them. And if anyone were to look at the map today and ask where did these battles get fought? So you must now see that Mecca is down here, Medina is all the way up here, about 400 kilometers to the north, and you find that Badr and Uqud are actually around here, not around here. So you get a sense of who is attacking whom. How many of you have made the Hajj? Let me see your hands. And I assume that you've made the Hajj, you've visited Medina. So if you wanted to go visit the site of Uhud, where the Muslim shuhada are buried, do you start from Mecca or do you start from Medina? Okay, somebody said Mecca, right? Let me hear it, what? Medina, right? Of course, of course. If you start from Mecca, you go all the way to Medina, you put your bags down, you get checked in and you and you can uh, buy a few beads and so on, do a little bit of shopping, and of course, you see the um, location where the battle of Uhud was fought. That means that these non-Muslims marched all the way from Mecca and came up to meet the Muslims at Badr, which is between Mecca and Medina, but close to Medina. They were not happy with that. The following year, they came back to meet the Muslims at Uhud, which is near Medina. In the fifth year, they come back again to meet the Muslims and they go to attack from the north because that's the only weak point to enter Medina. This time, the Prophet Muhammad gets an advice from Salman, the Persian, who said that uh, there is a technique that the Persians employ to ward off the enemy, they dig a ditch. Prophet, peace be upon him and his companions, um, did dug that ditch to protect the city from this onslaught, from these marauders. And uh, that in fact staved off the battle, so that after waiting it out for about three weeks, eventually the non-Muslims had to depart, the Allied forces were scattered, and the Muslims were safe. But if they had their way, they would have decimated the Muslims on that occasion. So now, finally, the Prophet Muhammad and his group comes to be known as a force to be reckoned with. Because after all this Allied force has gathered, it turned out to be for nothing. So it looks like the Muslims can hold their ground. Now they have a the hand to hold up high. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu calls his followers to go and make Umrah the following year. This is now the sixth year of the Hijrah. Remember that? So, second year of the Hijrah we have Bab. Third year we have Bukhut. Fifth year we have the Battle of the Trench, Karma. And then, now the sixth year, the Prophet sallallahu sets off to make Umrah. But he's prevented from making Umrah. Many of the verses of the Quran actually uh, are found in Surah Al-Baqarah speaking about the imperative to make jihad actually are because the Prophet Muhammad peace be him and his followers are now prevented from going to worship. So one of the rationales for going into jihad is to clear the way for people to worship if they want to. How do these people prevent the Muslims from going into Mecca to worship God at the sacred shrine, at the Kaaba. In any case, the Prophet, peace be upon him, makes a deal with them. Even though it is his right to enter Mecca and make the pilgrimage, it was to be an Umrah, that's their pilgrimage, 
He nevertheless makes a deal with them. That he will take the pilgrimage this year, but he will come back next year. At which time they will clear the area for three days. Because they don't want their people to interact with the Muslims. They're afraid. If their people interact with the Muslims, the Muslims will give them da'wah, and then they will convert to Islam and they'll use, lose them too. So they want that the Muslims shouldn't come now when they're on prepared, to come back next year when they will clear the area. You can have it all. We just don't want to see you. We don't want you to give da'wah to our people. The Prophet Sallallahu agrees to that. There is to be a ten year truce. No one will fight against each other, I mean these two groups, nor will they fight against the allies of each other. This will give the Muslims a chance to make more da'wah, not to the Meccans in particular, but to others. The Prophet ﷺ agrees to that. Now there is a right, the agreement. And uh, Ali Rahman begins to write it, and he says this is the, the agreement between Muhammad, the Messenger of God, and the Suhail bin Amr. He's representing the Quraysh. So Hannah says, no, hold on a second. You can't write the messenger of God. Because if we had recognized him as the messenger of God, we wouldn't be having this agreement in the first place. So that has not to go. And now he says, I can't strike it out. Because how can a Muslim feel right striking out the title of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, messenger of God? So I was saying, right, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, because that's how we know him. Muhammad is not Abdullah. The Prophet says, okay, show me where it is. He strikes it out. And some of the reports say that he wrote with his own hand, Ibn Abdullah. And some of the missionaries tried to, ah, see, he was able to write. But the man who just writes his own name, that doesn't mean that he's literate, or that he can write a book, or he can write a book like the glorious Quran. But more to our topic. The Prophet has agreed to this. One of the conditions in this was actually quite clearly one-sided. It read that if one of the Muslims decides to go back and join the pagans, that's fine. He goes back, he will be kept. But if one of the pagans, or anyone from the pagan side, were to go and join the Muslims, he would have to be returned if demanded. So now this seems one-sided, but the Prophet ﷺ agrees. And it turns out that a, a, a certain young man had actually just arrived there at the time. And he was being demanded. And there was some confusion because apparently he had arrived before the contract was signed. And yet the Prophet, peace be upon him, allowed him to be taken back in chains. This was too much for the Muslims to bear. Many of them were confused. And they were asking, why is the Prophet selling out like this? To put it in modern terms. Omar Rahman went to Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr wouldn't give him any satisfaction. So now he came to the Prophet himself. He said, aren't you the messenger of Allah? He said, yes. He said, isn't Islam the truth? He said, yes. He said, but why are we agreeing to all of this? But it was hard to explain to them. Moreover, you have to understand that the Muslims had their animals which they were going to sacrifice at the sacred shrine or in, within the vicinity of, of Mecca and be sacrificed at Mina. They were being stopped at Hunaybiyah. What were they to do with these animals if they did not enter the area where the sacrifices are normally performed? They still have their hatch garments on. What are they to do with the Imran clothing? Even the Prophet ﷺ didn't know what he's going to do with his followers now because there is some disturbance in this camp. And Uru Salma, the wife of the Prophet peace be upon him, gave him an excellent piece of advice. He said, why don't you start? and your followers will follow you. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, began following the well, advice of our mother, Uthman Salman. He sacrificed his own animal, and then the others followed suit, and then people eventually calmed down because they had something to do. When you have something to do, you, you calm down. You have to be busy with something, and you stop worrying. <laughs> so the Prophet, peace be upon him, accepted these difficult conditions, and uh, they were on their way back to, to Mecca. To, sorry, to Mecca. So there, to Medina. On the way, this is when Surah al fatih was revealed. Surah 48 in the Quran is called Surah al fatih The chapter of the victory. And why is it called the chapter of the victory? Because it begins by saying, <laughs> We have given you a clear victory. Now what was this, how is this a clear victory? There was no battle. But the Prophet Muhammad, peace be 
the Quranic is said here, in this ayah, to have just won a clear victory. And according to the Mufassirun, this means that the treaty itself that was signed here was a victory for Muslims. And they explain that now, by this time, as 17 years had passed since the Prophet Muhammad sallam, began receiving his revelation for the first time. Remember, about 13 years in Mecca, another 6 years, about uh, 18, maybe 18 uh, years. And they say that in the 18 months that followed, since this treaty was signed, more people embraced Islam years preceding. Just in the few months following the signing of this treaty. So that proved that the treaty was a victory for Muslims. What was the treaty about? It was about peace. There was to be a 10 year truce between the Muslims and the others. It turns out that eventually the non-Muslims broke the treaty. And that gave the Prophet Muhammad reason to march back into Mecca in the 8th year. That will be 2 years after the signing of the treaty. He marched back into Mecca in the 8th year of the Hijra, and then he took it over. What made it possible for him to take over Mecca? The fact that he had signed such a treaty. The fact that people were allowed to communicate and, and to understand Islam. And people came into Islam so that the number of the Muslims swelled. The fact that even those non-Muslims in Mecca, such as Abu Sufyan, that man with the gray matter between his two ears, and even Abu Sufyan was actually softened towards Islam. And his own daughter by this time was now the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ was winning friends. He was making political alliances. And he married many women specifically for political alliances. So that he can strengthen his relationship with others. By marrying the daughter of his chief enemy, Abu Sufyan, he was actually softening up the other side. So people ask, why did the Prophet marry so many wives? Well, one of the reasons was that because of the special position and the need for Muslims to fight not only with the sword, but also to win the hearts and minds of others, the Prophet, peace be upon him, married women into a variety of tribes and peoples so that he could cement alliances with them. Um Habiba, our mother, was actually the daughter of Abu Sufyan, the wife of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Abu Sufyan was softened up. It was now possible for the Muslims to march in and to take over Mecca without fighting the Meccans. There was no battle. The time was right, and it was ready for Islam to be established there in a peaceful manner. And then the Prophet now, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace be upon him, has the upper hand. And he can take revenge on his followers. If the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wanted to take revenge, this was the uh, opportunity. Many, in fact, fear that he would do exactly that. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, to their surprise, actually announced to them that a general amnesty. And he said, I'm going to tell you what the Prophet Joseph said to his brothers. Remember Yusuf al-Islam, Surah Yusuf, Surah 12 in the Quran? He says to his brothers, La tasbih ba'alaykum al yawm. There shall be no blame for you this day. Yafir Allah lakum. May Allah forgive you. This is after his brothers had left him at the bottom of a well and he was taken away and sold as a slave. Eventually he rose to power. And then he had the upper hand over his brothers. He could crucify them. But he says to them, No blame on you this day. Now the Prophet, peace be upon him, learning from his brother in faith, Yusuf, and from the revelation of the Quran, which is coming down to him, he says to them, I tell you the same thing. No blame on you this day. May Allah forgive you. So he forgave his enemies. This is what the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was about. Now if anybody wants, they can go to the Quran, they can find the verses which deal with fighting, they can forget all about this history which I just uh, have recounted before you, the same history which is plain in all of the history books, and they can just say, oh that verse says fight. Okay, so fight. And in doing so, they are misunderstanding the Qur'an, they are misusing it, they are taking it out of context and they are making it mean what they want it to mean. Surely the Qur'an, and I'm going to end it right here, the Qur'an speaks to a variety of circumstances. It was revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, not all at once, but a bit over time. Some of it in Mecca, some of it in Medina. The entire Qur'an is about one program. It's about the life hereafter that we long for. It is about belief in God and about the communication from God. That is there from the beginning to end. 
the Prophet peace be upon him preached that in, in, in Mecca and he preached it also in Medina. The same objective is in those phases. The Prophet ﷺ in the Mecca phase did not come to defense of the Muslims in a physical manner. Because of course the Muslims had no power. And when you have no power, you have patience and perseverance. That too is rewarded and is a test from Allah And then when the Prophet ﷺ moved to Medina, when he had some ability that he could actually protect the interests of the Muslims, that is when he in fact rose in self-defense. In fact, he rose in self-defense also because by this time, he was a political leader. In addition to being a prophet of God, preaching the message about salvation, he was responsible for the safety and well-being of his citizens. He could not sit idly by and let the non-Muslims come in and attack the Muslims and decimate them. When they would come in and maraud and rape and kill, um, the Muslims would have to be defended. And that is why the, the, the Muslim polity had to rise in their self-defense. So now, in the, in the battle, the Prophet peace be upon him naturally would go on his own soldiers. He would encourage them to fight. The Quran that is being revealed to him by God would also encourage him to fight. So you will have verses in the Quran which tell Muslims to fight which tell the Prophet ﷺ to urge the believers on to fight. But that should be understood as verses which speak to the battle context. In the battle, any good general will say to his soldiers, kill them, blast them. Any good Hollywood movies lately? <laughs> so, of course, this is thought to be acceptable because in the battle, you either kill or you are, or you are killed. So, you have to be told to fight, you have to be energetic. But you cannot take the same command and transplant it somewhere else. That command to fight belongs in the battlefield. It doesn't belong on airplanes. It does not belong, belong on the London subway, or Glasgow, or anywhere else. It belongs in the battlefield, and only in the battlefield. When a Muslim is facing an enemy who may kill him if he does not kill the enemy, then of course, that's the, that's the nature of battle. And this is what the Quran talks about. In Surah 47, verse number 4, the Quran says, When you meet those who disbelieve, then there is the striking of the next. But then it continues to say that when you have gotten the upper hand over them, then you bind them firmly so that later on you will either release them for free or charge a ransom. So that the war would lay down its burdens. Now, it says when you meet the enemy, there is the striking of the necks. Some translators put this, when you meet the enemy, strike their necks. The ayah doesn't actually say that. Read it carefully. It's not in the imperative. It doesn't say in ribbon recall. It says for recall. When you meet the enemies, it doesn't say strike their necks, as some translations read. It says there is the striking of necks, which means that it's happening both ways. You're heading for theirs, and they're heading for yours. And now, what does the Quran say you should do? Does it say go ahead and kill them? No, it says when you have the upper hand over them, bind them so that later on you can release them for free or for a ransom so that the war would lay down its burdens. So even in the battle, the Muslim objective is not to kill the enemy, but to cause the war to lay down its burdens. And that can happen if you can bind them, so that you might release them later, either for free or for ransom, because sometimes you need that, sometimes you need to exchange prisoners or what have you. You see how easily verses of the Quran could be mistranslated, could be misused, can be taken out of context. So when we are so puzzled, how could such carnage be done in the name of God? How could anyone commit such carnage? And how could some Muslims voice such venom when they speak a message of hate and intolerance and violence uh, towards others? So we understand that some people are studying Islam superficially. They understand a thing here and a thing there. They take something out of context. We should also, to be clear, realize that some of the interpretations which in fact contribute to a violent outlook are very old. 
but they have been shaped in environments and in situations in, that are very different from our very own. We have the responsibility in our present times, being experienced as we are now, with the experience that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is causing us to live through. We have a responsibility to go back to the translations of the Quran and make them right. Make them correspond to that which is there in the Arabic. Let them read as a message of peace. We have a responsibility to let Islam finally be understood and we have a responsibility to practice Islam. And finally, brothers and sisters, I must say and will serve to minimize the misunderstandings that people have about Islam as a result of some world phenomena that they notice. Because if they see something happening that doesn't look like you, they will have second thoughts. They will say, that violence we know about, that's not Fatima in the office. That's not Ahmed I know down the street. That must be something different. Let them come to you to understand what Islam is about. You teach them, not only by word, but also by deed. Perform a random act of kindness the next the opportunity you have. And let that be a message about Islam. Not because you intended so, but because you're just doing what you are doing as a Muslim. You just perform acts of kindness. And let people take that as a message about the religion that you also hear. So,